This episode is sponsored by Upstart. What is going on Solo fam? My name is John Solo and I have finally returned from my summer sojourn to shed some light on the weirdest and wildest stories ever found in mythology and folklore. And to kick off my comeback, I wanna discuss a particular story that I think everyone watching this video has heard of, but not actually heard from beginning to end, King Midas and the Curse of the Golden Touch. Now, if you're like me, you're somewhat familiar with King Midas and his ability to turn everything he touches into gold solely because of how often he's been referenced in pop culture. Disney alone has incorporated him into their stories multiple times with Hercules, the animated series, Once Upon a Time, where he strikes a deal with Prince Charming, and even one of their silly symphony shorts from way back in the 30s. Then you have references to his curse specifically, like in Aladdin and the King of Thieves, where the antagonist's ultimate goal is to retrieve the hand of Midas, and one non-Disney example is this fever dream of a Skittles commercial where everything this guy touches turns to Skittles. I met a man on the bus today. I shook his hand. He'll never see his family again. Yeah, let's just thank the gods he didn't become a Little League coach. Imagine the massacre. Anyway, you might be surprised to hear this, especially given the legitimacy of that last example, but these depictions of Midas have not been the most accurate. And that is why I want to spend today breaking down his mythology in its entirety, including the myth where he's cursed with the ears of a donkey, and explore the idea that Midas may have been a real person. We've got a lot of good stuff in store for you this episode, obviously. Before we dive in though, I do want to say thanks to this week's sponsor, Upstart. So if there is one thing that everybody watching this video can agree on, it's that money is cool and we'd like to have more of it. Unfortunately, we're not all like King Midas and can't just turn our couch or cat into an 18 karat block of gold whenever we're low on funds. The good news is that we do have Upstart, a service that offers a fast and easy way to pay off all kinds of debt through personal loans. If you're someone who seems to always be carrying a credit card balance month after month, if you feel like you're trapped in this never ending cycle of debt like countless others before you, Upstart can help you on your path to financial freedom. Whether it's paying off your credit cards, consolidating high interest debt, or funding personal expenses, over half a million people have used Upstart to get one fixed monthly payment. The way it works is that unlike other lenders, Upstart considers more than just your credit score. They also use your income, current employment, and other info that you provide in your application to calculate the size of loan you qualify for. Not only can this entire process be done online, but with just a five minute rate check, you can see your rate for loans between $1,000 and $50,000 right up front, and you can receive funds as fast as one business day. So if you feel like you're just being consumed by debt and need a fresh start at a rate that's calculated special for you, go to upstart.com slash John Solo. And make sure to use that URL, upstart.com slash John Solo, so they know I sent ya. And with that, we're ready to jump into it. Make sure you hit those like and subscribe buttons to celebrate the return of Messed Up Origins and get more content like this in your sub box every week. And now, the Messed Up Origins of King Midas. So as is common with Greek myths, there are multiple versions of Midas' misadventures written by a variety of poets. However, the most complete rendition that survived to this day was written by the Roman poet Ovid and included in his poem called Metamorphoses. So that's the one I'm breaking down. And you might be surprised to hear that this myth actually starts with the death of a different figure that we talked about almost two years ago, Orpheus, the most talented musician in the entirety of Greco-Roman mythology. After Orpheus's wife Eurydice died and he failed to rescue her from the underworld, he got extremely depressed and swore off all women which was a bit frustrating to the many Thracian women who wanted to marry him. And when their frustration reached its peak, they beat Orpheus to death with sticks, tore him limb from limb, and threw the pieces in the river. Little did they know that Dionysus, the god of wine, witnessed their attack and was so disgusted that he punished the women by turning them all into trees. But even after dealing out that much deserved punishment, Dionysus was still feeling unsettled. So to take his mind off the day's events, he threw a party in his vineyard and invited all the usual suspects. Suspects. Gods, nymphs, satyrs, the whole crew was having a great time, except Dionysus, who noticed that someone was missing. His longtime companion and tutor, Salinas, a lower level god of creativity, ecstasy, and drunken joy. It turns out Salinas was wandering around drunk, got lost, and wound up in the kingdom of Phrygia, where his drunken stupor allowed him to be captured by simple peasants and brought before their king. 
Midas. Though I should mention there's another version that I find hilarious where Midas simply finds Selenus completely unconscious in his garden. Either way, you don't have to worry about Selenus because Midas recognized him as his old tutor and mentor from when he was inducted into the Eleusinian Mysteries, and so they spent the next 10 days partying together and causing a ruckus. And because the drunkard god was known for spouting wisdom and being able to predict the future when he was drunk, an ability that experts now believe may have been aided by the Greeks putting psychedelics in their wine, the two had a really good time. So on the 11th day, when Midas returned Salinas to Dionysus safe and sound, the god was extremely thankful and agreed to reward Midas with any gift of his choosing. Much to his disappointment though, this well-intended gift becomes a curse when Midas wishes for everything that he touches to turn to gold. Immediately after getting his new abilities, Midas puts them to the test. He touches a twig, a stone, some clay, stalks of grain, and they all turn to gold. When he picked up an apple, it appeared to be given to him by the Hesperides. When he opened a door, it became as ornate and beautiful as a palace entrance. But when dinner time came around, Midas realized the mistake he made. For every bit of food he touched, whether it was bread, meat, or even wine, turned to gold. And suddenly, he began to panic. The king may have had riches beyond his wildest dreams and could now buy anything in the world that he wanted, but he couldn't enjoy a simple glass of wine or even eat a piece of bread. How long would he even be able to enjoy these powers before they caused him to waste away into nothing? Midas cried out to Dionysus, begging for forgiveness and admitting to his mistakes, and since the god of wine was a pretty chill dude, he decided Midas had learned his lesson and told him how to get rid of the curse. All he had to do was bathe himself at the source of the river Pactolus, so he did. And he watched as the golden essence left his body and began to flow down the river where it was said to turn the sands and rock into gold for years to come. And while some of you may scoff at that ending, it turns out there is some legitimacy to it. The Pactolus River was actually very high in deposits of gold and electrum, an alloy of gold. So high in fact that the nearby kingdom of Lydia used the river to sustain its economy. The more you know. Now one more detail I've got to mention before anyone comments about it is that there's another very well-known version of the story where instead of food being the trigger for Midas realizing his mistake, it's his daughter Marigold or Zoe. One day she comes to him with a handful of golden roses from her garden saying that she's sad she can't smell them anymore. And when the king gives her a hug to comfort her, he accidentally turns her into gold. And you can actually find references to this version of the myth pretty easily in God of War, Ghost of Sparta, Disney's her Hercules series, and she even appears in Rick Riordan's The Lost Hero. However, it turns out the original telling featuring his daughter wasn't actually an ancient Greek myth. It could be found in a book written by Nathaniel Hawthorne in 1852, where he reimagined several famous myths with the intention of teaching young readers lessons. Now, it's certainly possible that Rick Riordan and the creators of God of War were aware of that fact and decided to just roll with that version anyway because it's a little juicier, but if not, it's pretty crazy the impact that Hawthorne Thorne had on the public's perception of a 2,000 year old story. I am so happy to say though that Midas's misadventures do not end with just that one myth because while the king may have learned to appreciate what he had, he still needed to be taught when to keep his mouth shut. See, after the incident with the golden touch, Midas hated all things related to riches and material possessions. So he moved to the wilderness to worship Pan, the god of nature. And while out there, he was lucky enough, or I guess unlucky enough, to witness a musical contest between Pan and Apollo. Pan played his flute while Apollo played his lyre. Meanwhile, the shepherd god, Timolus, watched and judged. After the gods had played their pieces, Timolus decided without hesitation that Apollo was the better musician of the two, which isn't surprising when you consider that he taught Orpheus how to play the lyre. But still, Midas was not having it. He threw his arms up and yelled that Timolus's judgment was biased and unfair, which Timolus responded by saying, you will have ears to match the mind you have in judging. And just like that, Midas's ears stretched out, filled with little white hairs, and before he knew it, had taken the form of a donkey. So to make it worse, Timolus wasn't nearly as forgiving as Dionysus. Unable to get rid of the ears himself, Midas was forced to cover them with a purple turban whenever he was out in public, a strategy that worked great until he needed a haircut. Naturally, the servant who was chosen to do the deed was shocked by the revelation that his king had donkey ears, but he obviously couldn't tell anyone without putting his life at risk. So to get it out of his system, the servant dug a hole and whispered the secret into it before filling it back up. Yeah, it was a weird and not very effective decision because about a year later, some reeds had grown on that spot the servant whispered to, and those reeds told the secret to anyone who would listen. Granted, I don't 
know how many people talk to plants in their spare time, but all it really takes is one to spread the message. Unfortunately though, that is where the story ends. We don't know if Midas ever recovered from this PR disaster or if the servant suffered any repercussions for his actions. Honestly though, hand to Zeus, I think the biggest tragedy is that we lost the myth about Midas's experience in the bathroom when he had the golden touch. No! Now the two myths that we just went through are the only two that survived the sands of time. However, there are other writings where Midas and his misadventures are referenced, and if we compile those, we can learn a little bit more about the king. For example, while he may not have had a daughter in Greek myth, there are multiple references to him having a son. It's just the identity of that son that varies. One poet, Sositheus, says his son was named Latirces, and that he often challenged people to harvesting contests, whatever that is, and would behead the ones that he beat which was all of them, until Heracles came along and showed him there's always a bigger fish, before cutting off his head and throwing his body in the river. If you were to ask Plutarch though, he'd say Midas' son was named Anchorus, and there's a little mini myth about him. At some point during Midas' time on the throne, a giant chasm opened up in the middle of his kingdom, and when the king consulted the oracle about it, she said the only way he could close it was if he threw in what was most valuable. Do you see where this is going? At first, Midas tried throwing a bunch of gold and silver into it, but the chasm was like, no, 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 no. You can't buy me off that easy. That's when Anchorus stepped up. He said that nothing was more valuable than life itself, mounted his horse, then the two of them jumped into the abyss. And as hilarious as it would be if the hole still didn't close and the guy just jumped off the edge for no reason, I'm happy to report that Anchorus' sacrifice was not in vain and the chasm sealed itself for good. Now, if you've done any of your own research into the mythology of Midas, you've no doubt come across some claims that he was a real person. And maybe you even clicked on this video in the hopes that I'd be able to shed some light on those claims. Well, after doing a lot of digging with my new research assistant, Meredith, who unlike me, actually has her master's in history, I can say with complete confidence and certainty that we still don't know for sure. But let me explain. I mean, if you look at the timeline, he supposedly ruled Phrygia during the 8th century BCE, and these myths were recorded almost 700 years after that, which is a reasonable amount of time for his misadventures to be mythologized. However, we still don't have anything that directly links mythological Midas to the real one, besides his name, which has led some scholars to claim that there is no connection, but rather that Midas was a common name for Phrygian kings back then, and was assigned to the character for that reason. Basically, think of it as if you're writing a fiction story about Britain and need a nice royal name for the king character, so you name him Charles. That doesn't mean your story is about the King Charles, but instead a king named Charles. I know, it's confusing, but if the royal families cared at all about confusing people, then they would have been way more creative with their names and there wouldn't have been six King Georges. But this all begs the question, if these myths weren't inspired by real world events, or at the very least a real world person, then why were they written? Well, there's two possibilities. One could be that they served an etiological purpose, meaning they explained a real life phenomenon, like the river Pactolus being so rich in gold. But another explanation could be that, like the dozens of other folk tales we've covered on this channel, they were written to promote good morals. Like the Golden Touch story teaches you to be careful what you wish for and that money is not the answer to all your problems. Meanwhile, the ass's ears myth shows you why you should think before you speak. And while normally I'd say that's the perfect note to end on, I've got to tell you guys about the most bizarre reference to this myth, which can be found in a text-based quote-unquote pornographic video game called Leather Goddesses of Phobos. In said game, there is a character named King Meter who is cursed so that everything he touches turns to a 45 degree angle. You heard that right. Not sure how that would work exactly, and since the game is text-based, we'll unfortunately never get a visual example of it in action, but it is something that exists and I felt obligated to bring it to your attention. So that solo fam was the messed up origins of King Midas. Now you know the real story in its entirety and where the Midas touch jingle comes from.
Isn't that life changing? I would have to say it is. So if you want to express your gratitude for me bestowing this arcane wisdom upon you, make sure you hit those like and subscribe buttons to not only keep the channel going strong, but also get more content like this delivered right to your sub box every week. I also recommend you follow me on Twitter, Facebook, or Instagram, because even though social media is poisoning our society from within, it is the best way to stay updated on Messed Up Origins news, like when new videos are coming out and what they'll be about. Also give my little princess Penny a follow as well, because while I was in my Midas costume, I accidentally turned her into gold, and now I've got to make it up to her. I'm sorry, okay? I know it was wrong. It was an accident. I'll see you all again next week with yet another episode of Messed Up Origins. This one will be on a very, very highly requested nursery rhyme. Until then, my name is John Solo, and remember, John shot first.